Okay, that's a great question. I wanted to write a book that was aimed at the, uh, the prison population uh, because of all these letters I received, and, and, and they came from the most unexpected source. You know, I, the first two books I wrote, a book called Letters to a Young Brother and my second book, Letters to a Young Sister, they were just, you know, general motivational books for teen boys and teen girls. And, but somewhere along the line, um, youth judges started assigning the books and, and assigning um, young juvenile defendants to write book reports based off the books. And a lot of the wardens and the judges would send me these book reports and eventually started sending me letters. And I started having a letter exchange back and forth with a lot of these folks who were incarcerated. And uh, it struck me in many ways, a lot of these letters, the first, one of the first letters I got is the first letter that's presented in my book um, from a young man named Brian. And, and, and these letters moved me to the degree of wanting to figure out what's going on with our incarceration system and how could we put forward some solutions and inspiration. Well, I want to be clear about the book, first of all, that the book isn't just for folks who are actually in physical prisons. You know, many of us are in prisons not made of iron bars that I hope the book will help set free. You know, it's, it's for, written for anybody who feels stuck um, in any way. Sometimes we feel stuck in a job or a career or by our parents or or, or, or in a relationship, or our kids, or, or by debt, uh, credit card debt, or mortgage debt, et cetera. Um, and then there are folks that are actually in a physical, physical prison. Um, a lot of the things that I talk about in the book, this concept of mental freedom, that, I, that Dr. Rudolf Tanzi, who's a neuroscientist at Harvard, he contributes to the book and speaks about how most of us make decisions, whether we're incarcerated or not, that we don't even know why we're making them. We just make them out of habit. We inherited fears from somebody else. In the book, I talk about fear stands for false evidence appearing real. We get all this false evidence appearing real from sources we don't know why and how, and then we make these choices that are ultimately can be destructive for us, but we don't know why. And so I have techniques about how to, to get out of that mindset, to establish some mental freedom. We talk about the seven C's, and you gotta pick up the book for all the C's, but one of them obviously is courage, one of them's creativity, one of them's collaboration. All of these are different C's that you apply in your life. Uh, uh, to, 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 to live the best life you were meant to. So there are a lot of things that I talk about in the book, and probably the most important is the, at the end of the book, it's called the owner's manual. And I provide an owner's manual about life for anybody who's getting out of prison or anybody who's just living life. Step-by-step um, -step instruction about things to be thinking about, things to incorporate in your life for living what I call a truly wealthy and healthy life in, 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 in all areas. There are a number of states and a number of places that if you just look at the data, there are so many young African-American young men being sentenced. But let me say this, and let's be very clear about this. The number one through line about individuals who are being incarcerated at, at alarmingly high rates is not race and it's, not, it's poverty. We are locking up an amazingly high number and percentage of poor black young men and young women. We are locking up an amazingly high percentage of poor Latino young men and young women, and we're locking up an amazingly high number of poor white folks, okay? Poverty and corrupt and busted underfunded school systems is this pipeline to prison. All the data shows us that every $1 we spend on early childhood education and how well we fund our public school systems will impact, we pay back $7 on not having to lock somebody up. But in many of our states, Alabama included, Louisiana, Texas, I mean, we can go on and on and on. It's, and it's not just the southern states, let's be very clear. It's not just the southern states. They are locking up folks at alarming rates in ways that is unprecedented in human history. There are more African Americans in prison today than there were slaves in 1860. If that doesn't raise your eyebrows, something should. You know, there's, there's no doubt that we have a mass incarceration crisis in this country. 
Um, we lock up six to ten times more people in our country than any other industrialized nation in the world. Uh, China has four times more people in its country, and we lock up more people than them. We have, we're 5% of the world's population. We hold 25% of the world's inmates. We're a better country than these hyper-incarceration rates would suggest. So that being absolutely true, uh, has the president done enough? Um, incarceration, most inmates are incarcerated by their state. You know, and the, obviously the president is on the federal side and there are federal prisons um, around the country, but the biggest prison systems are state by state. And it, without question, we have to figure out ways to get our politicians, local, state, and federal, to stop just running around with general, quote unquote, tough on crime rhetoric, um, creating laws, for instance, they say it's the war on drugs that started 30 years ago, or creating laws based off a baseball rule, but not necessarily good criminal justice. Uh, three strikes, you're out. What if in baseball it was four strikes, you're out, or five strikes, you're out, you know? Um, this is stuff that people used to get elected and say they're tough on crime, but I'd re much rather elect politicians that are smart on crime. We can be much smarter with our criminal justice system. We can take nonviolent offenders and seek to give them training and rehabilitation while they're incarcerated. Am I set, sitting up here saying that crime is good and it's okay and folks shouldn't be punished? No, I detest drug dealing in communities. I detest drug dealers who push poison in our communities, right? And I believe there should be penalties meted out, but the penalties should match the crime and also try to give someone an opportunity to not be a recidivist and, and try to break this cycle of recidivism. So we can be much smarter on crime. We can be much more focused on rehabilitation um, rather than just straight lock up somebody and throw away the key, forget about them, and let them out with a felony on their record for the rest of their life. Um, there's a lot of people out there that I know like to want to get involved and, and, and but don't necessarily know how, want to do something. One way I set up a facility to gift the book into prisons. Um, if you go to www.incarceratorbrother.com, that's just incarceratorbrother.com, one word, I've listed out, it's an informational site, I've listed out prisons state by state by state with the warden's names where you can actually send the book into the prison. You buy it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Send it into the prison with the warden's name, with the instruction to add it to the prison library. They will have to do that. They will do it. So at least it's a way for you to give back during the holiday season, get involved in this, and you know you're making a difference.